back at you again. Good afternoon. Well, it's afternoon here. I don't know where you are and what time you will see this, but it's afternoon here. I am Senator Sanders, and the show is called Let's Be Clear. Why? Because this is a day and age of fuzzy thinking. This is a day and age where you couldn't get a straight answer to a straight question if you if you hit it over the, over the head with a hammer, and I hope you don't. So, but we're going to try to get straight, simple answers for you. And the question of the day, and today is very important because this is July 1st when this is being uh, taped. And this is the day that New York City reopens. Yay! Or is it yay? Am I clapping too soon? I have two. Uh, in fact, I'm going to have three as time goes on. Uh, specialists, I'm talking about way out there. I'm talking, uh, I can't even pronounce what they do. And that means they are really, really good at it. Uh, and, and I'm using that lightly, but I assure you, when you look up their credentials, you will be as impressed as I am. Uh, in fact, my my first guest uh, is one of the first whistleblowers on the Delta uh, variant, uh, a variant of the COVID-19 that is proving to be tougher, more contagious, uh, just a tougher bug to deal with. And I'm going to ask each of my, my guests to spend, a, a, they give me the 20 second version of your resume as you answer this question in your first Dr. Ding. I want to know, did I clap too soon? Is, is it time to clap that New York City is free and clear of COVID? Let us all proceed to the beach, to the nightclub, to dinner, uh, grab each other's hands, hug each other, victory over, victory over Delta or disease day. We can kiss strangers in the street. We can do all kinds of stuff, just like we did at the end of World War II. We're ready for that, Dr. D? Uh, I'm not sure about that all the way. Um, happy to be here. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm an epidemiologist. I think that's the long word that people have trouble pronouncing. Um, and I've been an epidemiologist for the last 15 years. And and I used to be at Harvard, and uh, now I'm at the Federation of American Scientists. I will say this is not. I, I'm. I have nerve. I, I'm a little nervous. Let's just put it that way, because the, you know the cases have been falling. That's amazing. That's yeah. great. But the most of the cases that have been dying out are the old strains. The old strains are dying. They're gone. They're disappearing. The, that COVID is over. There's a new COVID 2.0, and that's with the Delta variant. The Delta variant is not your typical variant. There's been other variants. The Delta variant, it is, it's like, you know, the saying, uh, faster, higher, stronger. It is much faster transmission. It's two times faster transmission. Uh, and by two, I mean, like, instead of originally three people to nine people, we're talking about, like, now six people to now you know, 36 people, like that's, that, that's what 2X means in terms of exponentially 2X faster. And uh, in addition, it's higher risk of hospitalization. We're talking about two and a half times than the previous variant, which actually means four times higher risk of being hospitalized than the original Wuhan 1.0 strain. And the vaccines, the first dose of the vaccine used to work semi-good, but the, now the first dose vaccine is pretty crap. It's less than 30%, 18% efficacy actually with one dose. With two doses, with the Pfizer, it's like, um, you know, mid eighties, but actually for in, actual infections, only 79. Instead of, instead of the 95 we used to be, uh, remember with Pfizer, it's now literally in the mid eighties to, you know, upper seventies. That's the new Delta variant. And it's the one that burned through India and caused likely well over a million deaths. A million deaths in a month, a month and a half. And that's, that is a variant that is now circulating in half the countries of the world in 90 different countries. 
US, it's surging. It, like UK is, uh, it's like 100% Delta variant. Russia has consecutive record highs. Um, Scotland in the UK has, is now at a record record high that exceeded even their winter surge. And it's, a, it's the Delta variant. The hospitalizations are increasing. And in Scotland and the UK are actually more vaccinated than the United States in terms of fully vaccinated. Their, uh, Scotland's 49% fully vaccinated, UK overall is 48. Uh, and Israel, which is the, one of the, the most fully vaccinated countries in the world, 60% fully vaccinated, is having a surge, a really exponential sharp surge. And their hospitalizations hey, are man, also- I, I took Moderna, so I'm safe. I took the, mm -hmm. the Moderna. Yeah, well, I would say, yeah, you're safe, but you know what? Half the country has not gotten uh, fully vaccinated. First of all, um, Moderna is pretty close to Pfizer. You're safe as in, yeah, well, think of it this way. You're 94% protect from being hospitalized compared to no vaccination, but that's not foolproof. You know, if you have risk factors, if you're elderly, if you have risk factors, that's, uh, you might actually be a little bit lower than 94%. And if you get infected, uh, you, your actual chance, uh, it's about 80% or lower. It's, it's not what we think as um, like a foolproof, foolproof. And you can still get it. And more importantly, you can pass it on to a child or an immunocompromised person, someone on chemo, someone with immunity issues, someone with an organ transplant, and, and of course, someone who's unvaccinated. And they will be uh, really bear the front. Remember, in certain ways, in epidemiology, you can have a virus that's like um, more deadly or more contagious, but not more deadly. Um, and you can say, well, which one is it going to really kill more in the end? The virus is more deadly or more, more contagious? The, it's the virus is more contagious because it will balloon a, a smaller percentage of a big number is actually yields a bigger number in the end. And the problem is it will just balloon, balloon, and you'll actually have a much larger number of cases. Um, <clears throat> and, and of course, Delta is also more severe and more contagious. It's the worst of both worlds. Um, and the other thing is, uh, you know, there in HIV, and, and I'm sure um, the, the other doctor here uh, can also discuss this, when there's something called a Peltzman uh, effect, as in once HIV uh, drugs were available and treat prophylaxis were available, people actually behaved in a more risky manner. Mm. So it's kind of like this feedback. Once people think they're invulnerable and vaccines give them the sense that they're invulnerable, they actually behave in a riskier fashion. They go to nightclubs, they party all night long, and you know they may be themselves protected, but they're actually still endangering and spreading the virus around and potentially even more. And so this is the thing where half the country is not vaccinated. And, and it's, they might, you might think that you know, our vaccination rates will slow down, but we're not at that level where it's gonna slow down uh, enough. This will affect uh, the vulnerable and we're gonna have a crap ton of cases. And the US is about 30% or, or Delta variant. And we're gonna catch up with the UK in about one month. So we're about one month away from a nationwide surge in hospital. And Missouri, which already is having uh, soaring cases, is already having overloaded hospitals. They're, they're diverting patients to neighboring states, to Kansas, because their hospital bed, beds are full in rural Missouri. That's what's already happening in low vaccination areas, which is only like 30% vaccinated in some of the parts of the South. It's really worrisome. Now, Dr. Dean, I hear you, but I'm going to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. right. I believe that, that you've just been in the lab too long. You've been studying those papers, you know. you got to get away from that. If you're in the club the other night, you'll be, you'll be fine, fine. Dr. Centella, New York City should absolutely throw its doors open. We can all go partying uh, and hug and do whatever we wish. The, the, the other doctor was, eh, yeah, we a little bit. Uh, over the top. Isn't that true, sir? Yeah, well, first and foremost, thank you for having me here today. Um, just by way of background, I'm a professor of health administration and policy at the U University of New Haven, 
where I also serve as university COVID-19 coordinator. And I've spent most of my uh, professional life over the last 20 years or so working in HIV, STDs, and other infectious diseases. And as was mentioned earlier, there are a lot of similarities between the way um, uh, we dealt and continue to deal with the pandemic of HIV and, um, and COVID. And, you know, um, I certainly agree with, uh, with you know, the, the key themes that came out of um, Eric's uh, uh, remarks in terms of, you know, how severe the Delta variant is being kind of, you know, fitter and faster and um, the burden and the fatigue that the American public is facing and how do we really deal with that? And I think that's really an important question. You think about policymakers, legislators like yourself and your colleagues and the governor who, you know, while may understand and appreciate the science and public health um, data that goes into everything COVID related, it's also a balancing act, right? How much can the American public kind of face and burden with um, these kind of non-pharmaceutical public health interventions like mask wearing and physical distancing and limiting gatherings and you know a hand a proper hand hygiene and washing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now when you add the pharmaceutical interventions like the vaccines, people are just like, listen, I've been doing this for what, like 15, 16 months? I wore your mask. I kept my kids out of school. I, I, you know, I, I kept distance when I was at the grocery store. I got the vaccine or um, on my way to getting it, maybe I'm partially vaccinated or you know, maybe seeing those commercials or those signs for like the lotteries and the free college tuition really drove me you know, uh, past the finish line in terms of signing up for the vaccine. But I'm done, right? It's the summer, you told me 4th of July was gonna roll around, holiday weekend, happy birthday America, happy birthday me too, because I'm going out and having a good time. And while I certainly, I feel it myself, right? I'm a people person. I wanna be out there. I wanna engage with my community. I wanna engage with my colleagues, my students, et cetera. But I also know that I wanna stay healthy. And the last thing that I would wanna do, even putting my public health hat aside, is get someone else sick or cause even worse outcomes like injury, disability, or death. And so it's definitely that kind of balancing act right now. I think, you know, we're, what I would say, you know, kind of, in my own head, like phase three of the pandemic, you know, phase one were those early days where it was chaos, right? What's happening? Who's saying what? Um, the, the conflicting information between the White House task force and what local jurisdictions were saying, it was just chaos. Then we got to a better place where we understood the public health protocols, the mask wearing, the distancing, et cetera. And then we eventually added, you know, um, a, a number of uh, um, FDA emergency approved vaccine options. But now we're in this phase three, where, as was mentioned earlier, the, the Delta variant, which is the, the variant of the day, it certainly may not be the only variant that, you know, kind of kicks us in the butt a little bit. How do we respond to this with, with all this kind of anger, frustration, fatigue? And then when you add on top of that, people's really strong, passionate feelings about science and vaccines and how good or bad those things are, it's a very complicated time. My own kind of personal opinion is I think New York, um, you know, uh, crossed the finish line a little too early. You know, I think we wanted to kind of pat ourselves on the back of being at the forefront of the COVID response. You know, we've always been known as being a very kind of forward thinking, public health friendly state. And, you know, I certainly um, um, have felt that as a New York resident for so many years now. But this isn't, this isn't about, you know, the, the gold star or the blue ribbon or the certificate of completion. This is about how do we get ourselves to the true finish line, which will not happen this summer. I think, I think most people will, will understand and recognize that. And so, you know, this is going to be an interesting summer because you know, for many, it's, it's a summer of transitions, right? We want people are expected to go back to work either fully or partially. We're hoping that younger children will eventually be able to get vaccinated as well. You know, people are very eager to see what the next school year will look like, mass, no mass, you know, middle school and elementary school kids vaccinated or not, what's happening. So there still are a lot of question marks that need to be answered. And we, we simply don't have the answers. And so while everyone wants to say, I'm done, this is over, I'm moving on, you know, you hear all these phrases, hop back summer, this, that, and the other thing, we're not there yet. Well, let me take a moment to speak. I, I again, am a senator in New York State, and some very interesting things happened 
when we requested that New York State, New York City Department of Health uh, come on this program. Uh, both uh, said that time constraints and they had all the people, said, you, you know the official words, you can, you can put them in there. Now, if I were a lesser person, I would think that they were perhaps a little hesitant to, uh, to put their stamp on this great statement of New York is open. Uh, of course, I'm being paranoid and I'm sure that there were, there was, everyone was busy doing the good work of, of the state. And uh, I'm sure that that was the case. Um, but, but, but Dr. Dean, what should we do? If, if, if I have to take your prescription, sir, uh, and, 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 and it seems to be, um, and since I, I've been saying, it's not physician heal thyself, but physicians heal us. Uh, but no, a, that's a good question. I, yeah, like, what should we do? First, first of all, I want to say as a former New Yorker, I used to work for the New York City Health, uh, Health Department, uh, Health and Mental Hygiene, okay? So I, I don't know the full yeah. title for back in the West Nile days under um, Tom Frieden. Oh, so, uh, you know, I know my way around New York, and I know the culture in New York, and, you know, it beats with the, you know, the city never sleeps, and it is the most highly dense city in the world at the same time. This virus is an airborne virus. It spreads when people are compact together indoors. And the key thing is you either in that situation ventilate the air or you clean the air mm. or wear a mask. Now, wearing masks is tedious. No one wants to do it. Indoor dining, of course, by definition, you take off your mask to eat. You're spraying, talking to someone. It's a little risky. Why can't we, you know, people have already had restaurants on the curbside, outside sidewalk restaurants. Let's keep doing that. I don't think that's that's that bad. I think we can still have outdoor dining. It's summer, it's not that cold anymore. Um, and if you have any indoor stuff, you know, short of wearing masks, which I still feel we should, you know, ventilate the air, like make sure the air, there's a strong draft blowing fresh air through it. And, and the recommendation is at least six air exchanges an hour, which is like basically airplane. Uh, air exchanges. And when you do, do that, also add HEPA filters uh, and add UV disinfection. You know, not UV as in you directly shine on your skin and get cancer, but there's like upper air UV where you install it near the ceiling and you blow a fan up and down. And as anytime the air goes up, it gets zapped in the UV. There's no actual UV on you. And that upper air UV or a portable HEPA filter for smaller rooms. And you can actually clean the air, ventilate the air, and keep people safe. Like you either fully vaccinate everyone, have a rule that if you want to enter, fully vaccinate, or wear a mask, which is a little tedious, or fully ventilate and disinfect the air. Do at least two out of the three. And you know, if, or if you have two out of three, if you have vaccination rules, come in if you're unvaccinated, uh, it come to you know studio audience like Stephen Colbert shows, taping with fully vaccinated audience and air disinfection of air ventilation, you can keep most of the things that we love open, Broadway shows and all these things. And of course, testing on top. Look, we can have all that, but we're not doing them all. We know only a few places you know, you know, require the fully vaccinated. And the thing is, the other thing is, if you mix vaccinated and unvaccinated people, you can still spread the virus. We, we've seen it so many times in so many places. And we, if we want to, I am, I am not like a lockdown, but these are all things I mentioned to avoid lockdowns. But if you don't do these things and you just party like it's 1999, right? You're going to have lockdowns because the cases are soaring. Like we're, again, Missouri is, there are hospitals in Southern rural Missouri that are overloaded. They're sending patients all across the state to other states because they have no more hospital beds. That's happening again. It's happening again. New York, luckily, is more vaccinated, but that just means it will hit New York a little bit later when the hospitals are getting more full. And give U.S. about, because U.S. is only 30% Delta, 
Once U.S. is a 100% delta like Scotland, where is having a surge equal to the winter surge right now, and they're more vaccinated, it will catch up and bite us. So until then, why can't we just take all these things that set short of lockdowns and closings, keep us safe? And that is my mantra. Let's keep clean the air, remember it's an airborne virus, and keep us safe in that way. Well, I'll tell you why we can't do that. And gentlemen, let me alert you that in this saintly assemblies, the devil needs a advocate and I shall be he. I'll tell you why you can't do this. For two reasons. First, this is the nanny state. This is, my God, people have responsibility. Don't they, everybody should choose what's right for themselves. And the government should not be interfering into people's business and the second reason is an economic point. The amount of money that you're talking about to keep us safe, uh, that will just, that will destroy the economy. Dr. Santillo, tell them, tell them that I'm right. <laughs> um, so, you know, a few things. Well, first, you know, I too am a former New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, scientist um, uh, uh, a career ago, but I, I was there. And I, I suspect maybe one of the reasons why um, no one took you up on your offer is when you think about, you know, the mayor versus the governor, the state health department, versus the city health department versus the CDC, there are a lot of strong opinions when it comes to COVID, COVID policy um, and implementation of that policy. And as you would suspect, you know, disagreement is not uncommon. But what I think, um, you know, what I think is maybe a more realistic approach to kind of uh, figuring out what the best policy is in terms of people listening and being responsive to it is thinking about a harm reduction approach. You know, in public health, you know, we, we generally don't force things on people. It's, it's very unusual. It's not, it's not un so uncommon when you talk about communicable diseases, um, but we generally like to kind of shepherd and guide people towards making the healthiest decision. So a lot of the things, you know, in terms of mask wearing and not, um, not congregating in large groups, particularly groups that have both, you know, unvaccinated or partially vaccinated folks, is to think about, you know, what can I do to maybe not eliminate the harm completely, but just reduce it. And I think if most of us or a lot of us would embrace the kind of, okay, maybe my behavior is not perfect, but it's better than doing nothing, we would be in a better place. And we have a lot of examples in public health, which I won't rattle off right now when it comes to tobacco and other things, drug use, where harm reduction really shows a lot of positive health outcomes. And while this is the first pandemic that most of us have experienced, at least as just citizens, as globals in global society, this certainly won't be the last one. I mean, you know, that's a whole nother conversation for another day about, you know, how easy it is to travel around the world and our interactions with animals and the environment and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I certainly don't want to be talking about COVID-22 and COVID-25 and, you know, uh, subsequent pandemics. And so we have to do it right now. And you know, saying that we know we'll readdress this in a couple of months, or let's just see how the summer goes, I think is a huge misstep. I mean, this is you know most people, including people who have you know really good and, and impressive credentials. If you were to ask them in the early days of the of the pandemic, you know February, March, April of last year, they would have told you by last summer this would have been done and dusted. And you know, here we are, you know, 15, 16 months later, and so you know, we just have to be cautious. And like I said, I, I hear it, I feel it, I see it on social media. You know, people are really just, you know, um, done with this. And I think we need to be a little more creative in how we approach um, uh, and explain things and using, you know, the things that we know work in public health, um, like community organizers, community influencers, um, bringing things to the, to a community instead of asking people to kind of uh, bear the burden of you know these complicated websites and these kind of nine to five hour shops and things like that, and you know we've done a little bit of that, but it's the time to abandon that is not right now. Well, even as our final doctor gets ready, and it's good to see you too. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to use my devil's advocacy with you, Doctor Sintel. You did not, I, I didn't hear that as a full-throated 
you agree with me we should that this is the nanny state and that we shouldn't do this and and that it costs too much money anyway uh, I, I i'm not sure if you said that um you know you're very observant i didn't say that <laughs> um you know i think you know I think there's a bit of um, conflict when it comes to, you know, I think a lot of people actually appreciate the hand holding um, and kind of the extra support and guidance that's provided through a lot of the um, COVID related programming because there is no alternative, right? You know, what else are they gonna do? And they're getting conflicting messages. They may not agree with some people, they're providers. You know, I've heard a lot of crazy stories from people with who are clinicians and the interactions with their patients related to COVID the importance of vaccines and testing and other kind of uh, issues. Um, but, you know, the money we're going to invest now in implementing our COVID mitigation strategies is going to be well worth it in the long run. I mean, think about people who are long term, the long haulers of COVID and the, and the symptoms that will last who knows how long or the multiple thousands of deaths that still may happen in the future. I mean, right, wouldn't you rather spend a lot of money now and have a really successful and healthy and, and thrive in the future as opposed to think, well, this is gonna cost too much. Um, and I know that's easier said than done. And there are a lot of businesses, particularly small businesses, mom and pop shops that, you know, they're at the brink of bankruptcy if they're not there yet. And so, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the one who's making the decisions around this, but I think to kind of flip the switch and just say, you know, let's just go back to pre-pandemic operations. We're just not there yet. That's just the bottom line of it. Well, Dr. Mahesha, I am one of those guys who had to make this decision and I am cashing it. And these guys are gagging up on me. So I need you to weigh in here. I need you to, uh, to I threw out the proposition that, that here we are and all of this talk of, of uh, further watching this is nothing but nanny state. And besides it, it costs too much money to do this. Now, I know you're going to agree with me uh, and I know you're going to say that, but I want you to take a, your 20 seconds to say who you are and then you can agree with me or uh, there's a slight possibility that you disagree, but please, good that, good that you're here. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Sanders, and uh, with this August panel. Uh, my name is Brahmar Mukherjee. I'm the Chair of Biostatistics, also Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I have been modeling the pandemic in India for the last 420 days, and it has, it is, it was, you know, the second wave in India has been very astronomic and severe. So I can share some of the experiences as they are doing lockdowns and opening up, also bring in some of the global perspective. Well, I mean, once you say India, it just sobers me and it takes me away from my my proposition, which I don't, which I don't believe in, mind you, but for the sake of this conversation. Um, now, now you get a chance to say to a New York State Senator what he should do here. I've got a bunch of people who said that they are tired of wearing masks, of hiding under their bed. They want to go to the disco. They want to go out and party. They want to sit with their friends and hug their neighbors and and whatever people do. Um, and you now you're telling me that now I got to look out for a Delta variant. What, what does that mean and why should I look out for it? Yes, so thank you for that question. And, you know, I am in the state of New York right now. I'm in Ithaca. Uh, I'm borrowing an office in Cornell University. So I can see on my way to the flight here, as well as, you know, restaurants and small businesses opening up and people gathering, reuniting together for 4th of July, which is really very uplifting. But we cannot deny the reality that the virus is there and the Delta variant is there. And uh, looking at the crisis in India, where Delta quickly became the very dominant variant, and it's highly infective. And so I think that um, I, I was always, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'll always are uh, on the side of caution. 
that's who I am. And what I am going to do in terms of my personal prevention strategy, that's what I'm going to recommend for the rest of the people. And, uh, and, and I wore mask as I went indoor. I went into uh, dine into a restaurant today, but I sat outside in the patio and the tables were far apart. I only took off my mask when I was eating. I am still, I sanitize my hand. I'm still trying to do a gradual transition instead of a discrete on and off because reality is that we really know, do not know a lot. And I have the humility of that unknown and the fear of that unknown. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dr. Dinger. Why, why, look at here, I got three, three of the greatest minds here. Why don't we know more about this, this problem? Why haven't we, we solved this? Well, I would say we do know a lot about Delta variant. You know, we didn't uh, back in April and May when when Delta slammed India. But we know the facts are, uh, the estimates are that 1.5 million people died in a month and a half, two months in right. India, and from the Delta variant, as high as three million people, and. People, 13 million people were infected per day in India, according to IHME models. And if you take that to New York City, it will be apocalyptical too. Luckily, New York is more vaccinated. But look, Israel is having surges. Hospitalizations are soaring again. And deaths are soaring also in, in the UK. Again, Scotland is more vaccinated than us. And they are having record high cases in the hospitalizations. You can't deny these things. Like, like as much as we want to celebrate Fourth of July, you know, I, I'm not. We're not going to be able to stop anyone from celebrating at this point. But I'm just saying, in August, the wave is coming. We will have hospitalization surges. We are already seeing it in Missouri. The hospitals are overloaded. It's a matter of time. Basically, this is the last. What I'm telling is, you have exactly one month. This is your last call to get vaccinated before the, the, the most deadly and fastest transmitting variant of the pandemic is here. That's all I'm saying. And you, it's like basically chance favors the prepared, right? And we only have one month to get prepared. And this is literally the last chance before this wave sweeps in. And, and you know, you can say, you know, just like I, we started this conversation about climate change. You know, oh, all those people denying climate change. How can they be so crazy denying climate? Look at Portland, look at all these, you know, polar vortex. You can't deny it. Like, but there are people denying it and still burning oil and like no tomorrow and drill, drill, baby, drill. We epidemiologists are the climate scientists. It's coming. You can't deny it. You can enjoy, uh, you know, running a Ford F-150 and burning gas and uh, all these things and rely on coal and oil. But it is coming, you can't deny it. And, and but, but the thing is in the pandemic, instead of 10, 20, 50 years to, before you see a sea rise, we're, we're, I'm saying it's gonna come in late July, August. It's coming, there's no stopping it at this point. Well, Dr. Santella, let me, let me give you some context uh, of my community. Uh, all of you have been to my community, incidentally, Kennedy Airport. Next time, wave when you're flying around there. I'm down there. Um, my community did the second highest amount of dying from the first wave of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. Part of it was the, the airport fumes and things of that nature. Uh, and our, um, the, the population, of course, has a lot of people of color, uh, poor people, bad medical, et cetera, et cetera, all of the, and add to those the comorbidity, I'm learning your terms. Oh my God, I'm learning this stuff. Uh, I gotta stay in my lane. Um, but we're, we're, we're prime for, for destruction, if you wish. And we're discovering something. Although we had a massive amount of dying, there was so many dying here, that they the hospital had to hire the refrigerated trucks, plural, because they had to, they just needed, they had six refrigerated trucks, 18 wheelers. Um, and yet 
my community has one of the lowest cases of vaccination in the city. This is why we are gathered here together. And this is why I am taking the voice of uh, unreason. Uh, and I will continue that so that every question that folk may have in their minds, I'm going to raise it. So therefore, uh, you can deal with it. And, and I'm going to put it straight out there, Dr. Santella. Now, why is this not? part of Tuskegee 626, more Western medicine to playing games on people of color, primarily black. How can we trust any of this stuff? Well, um, I'm glad you brought up that point. Um, well, you know, I know your community pretty well. I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I live, um, well, I'm in, in process of transitioning right now, I live right on the Nassau County, Queens border. So I'm, you know, on a good day, I can be at JFK airport in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so um, I, I know and I love uh, Queens, you know, the diversity of all its people, its food, its culture. That's one of the reasons why I've spent virtually my entire adult life in, in the greater New York area. Um, but you bring up a really good point about trust and uncertainty. And when it comes to issues of trust, particularly with brown and black communities, you know, I know a lot of the conversation has been around historical injustices, like you mentioned Tuskegee, amongst other really um, horrific, unethical, illegal um, um, acts towards these communities by a lot of quote unquote credentialed, you know, scientists, clinicians, public health uh, scientists like myself. But what we also have to kind of bring into that conversation is the stigma, the discrimination, the racism, the homophobia, the transphobia, the xenophobia, et cetera, that takes place right here, right now, today, even COVID aside. You know, and so a lot of this mistrust or um, hesitancy, reluctance on the behalf of many people, but pre predominantly we're talking about black and brown communities is justified. You know, I can't argue against that. That's someone's lived experience, right? Whether it's them, their family member, their friend, their neighbor, at, at someone at their place of worship. I mean, who am I to take that away from them? And so, I think a lot of the conversation in terms of moving people's and shifting people's health behavior has focuses has focused on things you know 50, 100 years ago. We need to address what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And so that gets really complicated when you're in the midst of a global emergency like we're in now. And the other thing that I think is troubling for a lot of people, I'm talking about both my colleagues in, in medicine and public health, but also just lay people and community and other kind of legislators and policymakers is our reluctance to embrace uncertainty. You know, we are kind of um, uh, raised and driven by knowing, you know, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, this is what this protocol says, this is what this NIH or CDC or FDA guideline says, and we follow that. But that's evolving on a day by day, sometimes hour by hour or minute by minute basis. And that frustrates a lot of people. What you told me this about masks or this about vaccines a month ago, and now today you're coming on TV and telling me, oh, the World Health Organization is saying this, but New York City is saying that. That's really conflicting information. I, I hear it and I feel it myself. I have to scratch my head sometimes like, wait, did I just hear Dr. Fauci say that or Dr. Walensky from the CDC say that or Governor Cuomo or Dr. Zucker who, or whoever. And so that's confusing to put it just really uh, simply, right? And so I think part of the, the bigger picture that I hope is one of the lessons learned when this is kind of done and dusted and we have really time to reflect on how we can prepare for future pandemics is you know, uh, the value that goes into uh, pandemic preparedness and emergency response. You know, that was something that we kind of like brushed off for a while because we never felt these threats, right? When we talk about like Ebola and SARS and West Nile, like for most people that's something, it was a headline in the news, but it didn't really impact them. This impacts everyone. And so with these kinds of 
um, lived experiences that were really horrific for a lot of people with this conflicting information and, and really poor messaging at times, it's, it's driven this state of chaos. No wonder we're in the place, you know, you see, it's, it's easier to say this right now, but like, we shouldn't have expected anything else than what we're dealing with right now. And that's very frustrating for someone who works in public health. And, you know, like, I'll do anything. I'll roll up my sleeves. I'll help you set up the tent. I'll help, you know, do a, the, a vaccine drive. I'll craft the message. I'll, I can do some analysis. I'll do whatever is needed. But, you know, um, there's just so much chaos and conflict. And like I said, you know, our ability to embrace and accept uncertainty is just, you um, is really gonna keep us in this kind of holding pattern. Right before Drs. Mukherjee and Ding answer, uh, give me some answers to how I'm going to tell people who are scared or believe that this is just more of the above, more of, you know, uh, uh, Tuskegee, more the, the new Tuskegee 626, more, we don't trust these guys at all. I will say that your point, your an earlier point that was raised of how people want stability is really a, a point that government gets hit with. Uh, government does not deal with change well. Uh, you know, we, we like what we like, what we like it. And um, when you have to change this, we are change resistant and uh, for the best of us. So please keep that in mind. But doctors, you were going to give me some ammo with this, uh, you know, we don't trust the American Western, you fill in the blank. Uh, these guys, they've they, they lied to us so many times. Why is this not a lie? So I will give you a very personal story, if I may. Uh, and uh, my own sister uh, did not get vaccinated when the vaccines became very available in India. It was the month of February and there was no immediate threat of the virus because the curve was going down. And I was predicting through these models that a huge wave is coming and really encouraging her to get vaccinated. She did not, and she was waiting for the mRNA vaccines to make into the market in India. She thought the AstraZeneca vaccines are giving blood clots and people are dying. I'm a statistician. I could not convince my own sister actually to say that this would be the prudent strategy to get vaccinated with whatever is available because vaccines work against severe and hospitalization. So in the month of May, her entire family had COVID-19 in India and her husband was vaccinated. He recovered in three days. Both my nephew and my sister ended up in the hospital. My sister nearly died and was in ICU. And now she, but we don't have to learn it the hard way because we have done so many studies. And so uh, this is where I think the dilemma is that until it happens to you, it's something farther but we, this is reality. This is happening to so many people and vaccines are our exit ramp from this pandemic. So I think that we have to share stories. We have to share narratives. We have to earn trust and uh, we have to make a long-term commitment to resolving the structural barriers and inequities which have existed in our society. Yeah. Dr. Dean, I'm coming to you. I, I, I too must confess that my own brother is refusing to get vaccinated. And I, and I, I, as a historian, I know what he's talking about. I, I, can, I can tell him more cases than, than the, than the yeah. ones that he knows of. And I, I wanna also share, you mentioned Tuskegee a lot, and I really wanna share a story that Tuskegee, by the way, is a African-American founded research institute in the South. And it's actually one of, uh, it's obviously famous for the Tuskegee syphilis study, but it was more famous also in terms of legendary, in terms of its role in the polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so polio vaccine, people think of Jonas Salk, you know, and, um, and but, you know, in order to do the polio vaccine trial, he actually needed 400,000 vials of, first of all, this uh, from, um, um, from the lax uh, cells, so Henrietta Lacks, these cells that are immortal. And in order to do that, to do his trial, 
to prove that the polio vaccine worked, um, Jonas Salk needed 10,000 glass vials, refrigerated glass vials shipped to him every single week. And do you know who did that? It was the scientists, the black scientists in Tuskegee who literally went around the country, got everything together to produce 10,000 glass vials, ultimately 400 glass vials. This is deep south and you have to keep them refrigerated and they shipped them across the country, $10,000, uh, 10,000 vials, uh, glass vials on ice, 10% sure sensitive throughout the country in order to carry out. And Tuskegee was played a seminal role in making sure that the polio vaccine is was successful and proved it works and, and saved thousands and millions of kids' lives and their life and, and allowed them to walk the rest of their life. And Tuskegee is should not just be remembered for the civil study. African Americans were actually instrumental in making sure the polio vaccine worked for the world and made it possible for the world. Mm. And I think when people mention Tuskegee, I want them to remember the heroism of black scientists in making sure that Tuskegee was successful in making 400,000 glass vials on ice shipped across the country. And I think, the and you ask anybody, polio, like the number of kids killed, maimed, and unable to walk the rest of their lives, that is absolutely, absolutely worse. And right now, one in seven adults, even if you get infected, will have long COVID. And one in 12 kids will have long COVID. And long COVID, remember, it's not just deaths. Long COVID is memory problems, concentration problems, heart. We have, we have 15 year old former gymnasts who do flips and everything who cannot even walk anymore because of long COVID. 15 year old kids. And that's COVID. Long, that's the effect of long COVID. And the price, 1% of kids get hospitalized, but a one in 12, 8% of kids get long COVID. That is a price way too high to pay. Because we'll not just be paying it now, we'll be paying it our next generation. And so my arg argument to people who are resistant is, don't just think of yourself. Don't think of your kids. Think of our next generation. And I think those two arguments that if we shift the narrative, Tuskegee was a heroic institute that saved thousands of millions of, of millions of lives and kids' lives. And we can save uh, millions of kids' lives to, today and tomorrow. I think that's the most compelling. And I, hopefully that will resonate with your, uh, you know, Rockaway, uh, Queens, New York, uh, African-American community. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I, as a historian, I, I knew of Tuskegee, but I, I did not know of their role with the, uh, the yeah. polio. Um, yeah, I'll send you the article. There was an article that just came out uh, that someone's thinking about making this in a movie too. So it's, um, it's know, a true story. I, I, I think that you're right, that, that the Tuskegee is, is said that they're getting a bum rap, that, that, that they are far more than just one thing and, and uh, an unfortunate thing that they shouldn't have gotten themselves involved with. But, but they're far more than that. They are, you know, and all of Tuskegee Institute did not, was not involved in that. That's just one small area. Uh, and, and it has to be looked at at the context of the time. Uh, you can't really understand any of these things without knowing the context that they were, they were dealing with. Uh, now, now, we have to take a moment, doctors, to speak about what and and this is really important for me. I'm I'm government for better and worse. Oh God, God help America, uh, or God bless America, depending on your point of view. Now, what do I have to do to get ready for these people with long long COVID? Um, and I'm trying to figure out that it might be good to start making some um, inquiries into what percentage of our population has it. Now, uh, there may be a push in government to keep this quiet. Government uh, is a funny place. And there may be those who will want 
to not alarm the the people. Now, I am not of that of that number. I believe that people, by and large, are mature. That if you present it in a scientific fa fashion, that you can you can have a difficult conversation, um, and and come to some rational truths. Uh, well, Dr. Santana, it's, it's it's yours your position to tell what. How do I even? How do I shape the question about the the long COVID? What yeah. do I? What should I be looking for? And how should I? How should I approach this if I want to start getting us ready to aid these folk? Yeah. Uh, how do I go about this? Yeah, you know. I'm glad you raised this issue because the long haulers, you know, are certainly a group that will grow over time. Wow. And certainly it's my opinion that, you know, we, pro we probably only know, you know, the tip of the iceberg in terms of really who has these long-term uh, effects of, of having COVID-19 infection. Because you would imagine, you know, not everyone's really comfortable sharing that. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, um, may rightfully be a little um, hesitant or resistant to share information, even with their own primary care provider or other kind of specialists, because they're nervous about the implications of telling someone that they are still kind of facing challenges, whether it's physically or mentally, um, as being a, a COVID long hauler. And, you know, I think back, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, my background is really in HIV and AIDS. And you think about, you know, the people who are long-term survivors with HIV AIDS, which, you know, I'm sure you also have a number of them in your own jurisdiction and the stigma and discrimination that they still face today in 2021, when we know that HIV is a chronic medical issue and we have really effective therapy that, you know, someone who's diagnosed today and is adherent to their medication will live a long and healthy life and probably die something unrelated to their HIV, the same things that everyone else dies from. And so I think we have to start thinking about, you know, how we deal with people who have been infected with COVID, how the terms we use, how we address them to ensure that there are stigma free and discriminatory free experiences with the health sector, with government, because otherwise people are just going to shy away and try to kind of, you know, deal with it on their own. And, you know, that's not everyone's kind of style, right, to like share things and post it on social media and tell the world about what they're going through. And so, you know, I think we need uh, in systems. I know some of the New York City um, health systems are really kind of embracing the, the study of long term um, long haulers and what it means to be a long hauler, uh, what their experiences are and what's, you know, care and treatment they need to kind of live their full life. Um, and of course, you know, I would tell you as a legislator and policymaker that we need to ensure that our scarce resources are diverted and allocated towards studying this because you know like i said earlier this may be the first pandemic that most of us are living through but it certainly won't be the last and so we need to be a little more kind of forward thinking and proactive when it comes to our you know pandemic approach and response dr Mukherjee, and and you're gonna have the last word with, uh I'm, I'm coming to to you dr Ding too but dr Mukherjee, i here's a a preposition and this is that since most of the damage in New York State were to people of color, to people most of the death, most of the long haulers will be to the same population. Uh, would you would you say that there's some truth in that? Uh, uh, I I do think that we need to study. Uh, long COVID in more detail. And, you know, I come from Michigan, where Detroit was also an epicenter where communities of color got really affected by the first wave of COVID. And I do think that, you know, we need to really study the prevalence of long COVID. As you asked, how many do I expect in my community? We really need to more, do more studies and how that is distributed across different social strata. But I think the fact that you yourself are talking about it and recognizing it as a problem, I think goes a long way. 
And then we need to invest in research in, in talking with like the healthcare uh, capacity and also make sure that these people have the support. And sometimes, you know, it's uh, the mental support. I, I actually uh, monitor the chats in many long COVID support groups where people are talking to each other and sharing their concerns and to make sure that we recognize that this is a legitimate concern. This is not something somebody is inventing. People are experiencing this and to come up with long-term solutions and treatments and therapies so that people get the care that they need for a healthier future and healthier population. And because of, you know, sometimes the uh, concentration problem, the fatigue problem, if people are not being able to keep their jobs, we really need to be mindful. And so I think we need to set up not just uh, healthcare policies, but also economic policies and social policies. Uh, and first of all, I think you need to identify in your community who are these long haulers and set up a cohort of everybody who has been affected by COVID and then see who are still struggling, who are still experiencing symptoms. And I think that the more and more we do these community-based studies at a granular level and get buy-in for religious from religious leaders and community leaders to talk about it, I think we'll penetrate and address this problem. I think we have to identify and recognize the problem and give its own respect before coming up with the solution. Well, I agree with you. And right before I, I turn to your fellow doctor, I am, here's one of the takeaways I'm going to do from this. I am going to uh, request a study on the, the long haulers. And I am going to start questioning as to what resources do we believe will be necessary to deal with this group. Uh, I will try to get information on this um, so that's one of the takeaways I'm going to, to do. Now, my friends, the time, time has proven uh, not to be our friend, and we are, to, we are at the end here, but each of you, um, well, first, let me thank each of you for, for enlightening me. Um, I'm far better equipped, and, and, and I have the dubious distinction of being one of the folk who have to take all of this information that you've given and A, make it real to re real people, whatever that means. Um, and then B, make it real to government and get them to say, no, it's not going away. No, it wasn't a blip on the screen and we all can't just go back to, uh, to what we were doing before, et cetera. Uh, but each of you will have a closing remark that to, to make uh, and I, but in it, I urge you to tell me what is you, what are you going to do? What is your recipe for, for staying safe? Your, your regimen, what are you personally going to do? Uh, and we will start with you, uh, Dr. Dean. Um, thanks for having me. And I think I'm always the precautionary principle kind of guy. And I'm going to say, you know, let's protect our family and friends and our neighbors so that we will have many more holidays with them in the future. And second of all, think of the children because the children is our future, uh, children are our future, but one in tw uh, 12 kids suffering long COVID is something we do not want in our society. And the price of that to pay is, you, is unmeasurable and we must do everything we need our powers to do that, uh, to stop that. We have one month to vaccinate as many people as we can. Any person over the age of 12 is eligible. You know, I think the, the call for urgency, the final call, the train is leaving um, the, the station and this is your final chance to get vaccinated before Delta becomes dominant. I hope that is a call that people listen. And I think just, think of the long-term impact that if we have another search, the actual impact on our communities will be way, may, way worse than the small inconveniences we have right now. And the inconveniences, these are not like creating a nanny state. It's, they're small inconveniences. Uh, installing, you know, HEPA filters, and it's, 
you know, in a room of 20, it, it's literally just $10 per child uh, if in a school classroom. And it's way cheaper than the cost of a book uh, per child. So I think we can spend that in our schools, in our in restaurants. And I think that it will pay way more dividends in the end if we ventilate and disinfect the air because it's an airborne virus and we can't just wish it away. So just think of our kids in the future. And again, final call before the Delta wave really hits us in one month. That is so sobering. Uh, Madam Doctor, you will be last. Uh, sir, I'm just trying to get my hand around that. Uh, so many ideas. I'm thinking about um, using monies to give to the school system so they can buy filters and things of that nature. But sir, what did, what <laughs> what is your prescription? Yeah, well, again, thank you for having us. I appreciate the venue to be able to kind of speak freely about these really critical public health issues. You know, I have two messages I'm, I'm gonna end with. One is, you know, coming from a public health perspective. And like I mentioned earlier, really my background being um, mostly in, in HIV and sexual health is that, you know, our messages and our messaging is so important, particularly embracing those kinds of uh, risk reduction, disease prevention uh, messages using a harm reduction approach. We have to be realistic and acknowledge that everyone's life isn't perfect. Everyone's behavior, including all of our behavior, those of us on the call today, is not perfect. And the, the better we are at acknowledging these kind of real world uh, conditions and approaches to the way we live our lives and our health, the better we'll be, including in the long run. And then second, you know, I mentioned earlier about, you know, embracing the uncertainty of the, of the pandemic, that's incredibly difficult, even for me, and this is my line of work, it's incredibly difficult. However, that's how science works, right? Science is messy. You know, our experiments are messy. Our replication of experiments and trials is messy, but that's how we learn to improve things in the future. And so I think part of the bigger picture is really getting the American public to embrace the scientific process for all good and bad about it. Um, and, you know, um, you know, that's something that, you know, kind of as we kind of are able to kind of reflect a little bit as a pandemic progresses, I'd like to see more investment in, you know, building our capacity to understand how science works. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm just imagining what would have happened if the leadership at the highest levels embrace science at the very beginning of all of this. Uh, and we could, we could do that at, mm -hmm. at, at just about every country that was involved. If science had led, um, or at least the uh, rash reason, either one of these perhaps could have gotten us to the same place, uh, reason or science and, and who says that there's a great difference. There I go thinking again, Madam Doctor, uh, what do you believe? Thank you so much, Senator Sanders. Uh, and uh, this is a privilege to have this platform to speak with you and your audience. Uh, I, I, uh, what I have seen in India, uh, it was a national catastrophe and largely avoidable if we believed in what was coming. So what I have seen in my country of birth I do not want to see that in my country of residence and which I'm a citizen of now. And I really want to stay prepared and not living, live in data denial because it is staring at us as Dr. Ding has pointed out. We know a lot about the virus to design our personal protection strategies in the last 16 months. We know a lot about the transmission. So avoid crowded indoor spaces, pay attention to ventilation. If you feel comfortable, please, even if you are vaccinated, wear mask indoors. I am doing that because I'm not sure about my surroundings and I'll continue to do that. And I would like to say that no one is safe until everyone is safe. There is a collective work here and we need to work together so that we can escape this. This is not destiny, it is really in our hands. We have to think about zero to 12 years old who are still unvaccinated. We have to think about the long haulers, families who are still struck with grief and recovering. So this is, there is not a COVID has left a long imprint and it's not a magic 
a switch on and off that our lives are going to return to normal. So in the end, I'd like to end with a quote by a poet, uh, one of my favorite poem, uh, poets, Rilke. And um, he said that, let everything happen to you, the beauty and the terror keep going because no feeling is final. I think we have seen this struggle that we have persevered through that sometimes there is hope, sometimes uh, there is uh, sadness, but this is how life and history progresses. And we have to strike a balance between alarmism and denial, between hope and depression, and, and, and also really embrace what is going on. We are going through a historic time, but we are actually fighting this as one of the brilliant species in this world. Well, I thank you for uh, giving us hope at the end. Uh, sometimes these conversations can lead us to <laughs> wondering, uh, is there hope? And I'm, I'm glad you, you kept that in the, the Pandora's box. You didn't let out the hope. Um, so he, here's some of the takeaways. Here's a, I, was, I am in the process of doing a wall of remembrance to those who have died in the first phase, uh, the early days of this. And my, my first thought was maybe I should hold out for a moment because I may, I may need more space here, a bigger wall. Um, but I think that we still will go, your, your idea of hope, we still will go in, and if need be, um, and we should use that wall to help us stay motivated, mobilized in this war against this, this uh, illness. So uh, I again want to thank all of you for um, giving me so much food for thought. I mean, you really have, you will see the legislation that I put up. Uh, so you, this is, this is directly you. Without you, this would, this, it would not have happened. Uh, I can say that, and, and you can you can take that as your takeaway for your investment at, of the, of time, which I really appreciate that you were kind enough to do, and you will see uh, that we will try to come up with the the, the wording and and how to go about this, uh, and we will try to make it law, uh, not resolution or suggestions. We will start easy enough with them as searching for answers, but we are going to do this by, by means of law, because um, as many of you have alluded to, government is always strange the world over. And sometimes we find ourselves uh, fighting the different parts of government. And there's an African saying that says, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, indeed, that may be the case with two elephants of fighting, which brings us back here. So I want to again thank you, and I want to talk to the audience again, my friends. You you heard it. You you heard it yourself. You know it's coming, so you can't say you didn't know. Now we need to just hey, suppose you don't believe these guys. Suppose you don't believe a word that was said. Wouldn't a logical thing be to just, just in case, go ahead and mask and do all the stuff that they said, just in case. Because they, if, if they're wrong, fine. You'll have the last laugh and you'll be able to say, oh, all of this was foolishness. But if they're right, the laugh will be on you or could be on you. Uh, and under those conditions, it's not a good bet. The, the wisest bet would be to take precautions to make sure that if these learned minds are, are right, then you'll, you'll argue on another day. I'd rather argue with you on another day. The best way to deal with all of this, the system, we, we can argue that and it's worthy, but let's do that when you're here and not have you as a name on the wall of remembrance that we are going to have too many names already. I'd rather you stand with me saluting those than 
we salute your name on there. And having said that, I don't believe that we can say anything better. We have been as clear as we possibly can. Uh, and that is the nature of this show. And the title of this show is called Let's Be Clear. And you have heard it first. And I am Senator James Sanders Jr. And again, I want to thank my guests uh, for, for doing a real public service. Uh, and God willing, we save some lives here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, go out and enjoy, enjoy the fourth in a safe way.